Well, good morning, church. It's a pleasure to be with you. I wonder, when you hear the word rebel, what do you think of? What does a rebel look like when the word comes to your mind? Does a rebel look like someone who dresses a certain way, speaks a certain way, acts a certain way? Or does rebellion sometimes look like quiet indifference in the heart? Does it look like compliance on the exterior and hatred in the interior? Can rebellion look like an innocent child who is very good at lying, but who is very good at looking well-behaved when time is right? Well, I would submit to you that, yes, rebellion can look like that because I'm a rebel. But I don't think I look like one. But I am. You see, when I was young, one semester, I got a really low grade at school. And uh, my first thought was, well, I need to do something about this because I will get in trouble if my mom finds out my low grade. So I decided that I was going to permanently deny that I ever received a report card, right? <laughs> so I, in my mind, that was going to work forever. So my mom came up to me and asked me, Lucas, uh, where is your report card? And I said, Mom, I never got one. <laughs> report card? What is a report card? <laughs> right? Well, little did I know that my mom was not wondering when I received my report card. My mom was the principal of a sister school, so she knew down to the minute, the time that I was supposed to receive that report card. But in my young and innocent heart, I thought I could fool my mom. You see, I thought that my mom didn't know what she knew. And a cute little kid with a lip filled with lies can be so rebellious inside. Today we're going to be looking at Hosea 7. And, and the passage that we're going to be looking at is going to, is going to be about God exposing the sin of Israel. Yet, yet, I do not want you to hear the sermon and walk away not understanding that God reveals sin because he's a gracious God. God reveals the hearts of a rebel person because God wants that person to prosper and obtain mercy. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes, forsakes them will obtain mercy. So God, out of love for Israel, reveals the rebellion of the hearts. But before we get too far into the sermon, let's, let's think back a little bit. How, how have we gotten here, right? So we're looking at the book of Hosea. If you're new to us, this is a great book, and I think you'll greatly benefit if you go back on our website and listen to the previous sermons. Hosea was a prophet, and he was a prophet to, prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. Hosea is a part of of a group in the Bible of books called the Minor Prophets. They're not minor because their message is unimportant, but they're simply shorter books. One verse that really helps us understand the outline of the book of Hosea is Hosea 1, verse 2. It says this, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So the opening three chapters of this book are about Hosea pursuing his unfaithful wife. Hosea going after his unfaithful family. And then God uses these opening three chapters of the book and uses the illustration of Hosea and his relationship with his wife to tell Israel, Israel, just as Hosea, the righteous one, pursues Gomer, the unfaithful one, I 
the Holy One pursue you. God is a God who pursues rebels. And that's good news because we are all rebels in our hearts. Last week, Pastor Andrew took, took us through uh, chapter 6. And uh, in one verse in, par- in chapter 6 particularly really helps us link the rest of the book with chapter 7. Hosea 6, 7 says this, But like Adam, they transgressed the covenants. There they dealt faithlessly with me. So Adam, who had a covenant with God, breaks the covenant. And how does Adam break the covenant? By acting faithlessly. Notice that it doesn't say that Adam acted faithfulnessless. He was not unfaithful. He was faithless. Adam did not believe God. Therefore, he broke the covenant. Likewise, Israel broke the covenant. So chapter 7 now, you can fill this in, explains how the sin of Israel is like the sin of Adam. How is Israel like Adam? Just as Adam did not believe God, Israel did not believe God. Now, unbelief leads to rebellion. And so that is what we're going to see today. So God so far has told Israel, you are rebellious. Today, God is going to tell Israel, and this is how you have been rebellious. So I have four points for my sermon today. And there are hopefully you'll be able to see that they're all coming from the text. They're all answering the question, how did Israel rebel against God? What is Hosea's message of indictment? So Israel rebelled against God. I'm going to give you the outline now. And then as we go through the sermon, I will give you the outline again. Israel rebelled against God by sinning without regard for God's holiness. We're going to see that in verses 1 through 3. And then in in verses... 4 through 7, we're going to see that Israel rebelled against God by selfishly, selfishly embracing passions of the flesh. Number 3, we're going to see that Israel rebelled against God by seeking the approval of man rather than God. And that is going to be verses 8 through 14. And number 4, we're going to see that Israel rebelled against God by standing in enmity against God. Verses 14 and 16. What is my goal today? In other words, in in about 40, 45 minutes, what do I want to see happen? Here's my goal for today. My goal today is to show you that we are all rebellious, just like Israel. And we too, like Israel, should repent, return to the Lord, and seek Him. Whether you're a Christian or not, it is time to turn to the Lord and seek Him. So let's look at the first point, sinning without regard for God's holiness. Look at verse 1. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they dealt falsely, The thief breaks in, and the bandits raid outside. But they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By the evil, they make the king glad, and the princess by their treachery. So verse 1 opens up with God, with God depicting himself as a physician, right? A good physician, a soul physician. God would heal Israel. But what stops God from healing Israel? It is the iniquity of Ephraim that is revealed. The evil deeds of Samaria. Throughout this book, we're going to hear these different names, right? Israel, Ephraim, Samaria. And they're really all referring to to the same thing. Israel, Ephraim, and Samaria are the same. 
Israel is the northern tribe. Ephraim is, Israel is the northern kingdom. Ephraim is the largest tribe. And Samaria is their capital. This is the northern kingdom of Israel. These are the lost tribes of Israel. They dealt falsely with God. You see, thieves that are outside are breaking in in Israel. Bandits are raiding outside. Nowhere is safe. Israel can't find a safe place. There's no fear of the Lord. There's no love for one another. Israel did not regard God as holy. Because if they did, they would too be holy. Did you know that that is the evidence that you regard God as holy? That you too are holy? But instead of behaving like the Lord, Israel overlooked the consequences for their sin. Look at verse 2. We see that Israel did not think God would remember their sin. They lived as though God is not watching. But God watches everything. Proverbs 15 verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Keeping watch on the evil and on the good. There are three attributes of God here that Israel has ignored. Israel has forgotten that God is holy. Therefore, Israel forgot to be holy. Israel has forgotten that God is omniscient. Therefore, Israel lives as though God is not watching. And Israel forgot that God is omnipotent. He can do all things. Therefore, Israel does not fear the punishment of God. Friends, what a dangerous life to live. The one that is lived without fear of the Lord. It is good for us to fear the Lord. It is good for us to regard God as holy. When we forget who God is, that is when we feel most tempted to live a lifestyle that is against the character of God. It is when we forget who God is that we feel as though we can fool God. You know, my grandfather was a great uh, domino player. You know, he, he played domino really well. And, and as a kid, I would play dominoes with him. And I would only put a few pieces down, and my grandfather would start telling me what my next move was going to be. He was always ahead of me. Always knew what I was going to do next. It was like I was trapped. It was like I didn't have an option. Whatever he said I would do, that is what I did. Have you ever played a game with someone like that? There are always a couple of steps ahead of you. They always know what you're going to do. And when you think you fool them, oh, checkmate. You're done. Right? right, right. So I don't actually remember ever beating my grandfather on dominoes. And we played a lot. He was so good. He was always ahead. Well, that is how God is. When we think, when we think we're fooling God, we're actually fooling ourselves. Because God is not two or three steps ahead of us. God is a whole eternity ahead of us. God looks at time and he's outside of it. God is in perfect control of all things. Friends, do not be fooled. If you're living in unrepentant sin and you're thinking you're getting away with it, do not confuse the Lord's patience and mercy with him accepting your behavior and your sin. The Lord is waiting for you to come to repentance. Are you willing to come to the Lord? Do you live knowing that the eyes of the Lord are everywhere? 
Is there a distinction between the life that you live privately and the life that you live in public? When people compliment your character, does your spouse, do your children say, oh, if they only knew? It's better to confess sin than to conceal sin. Now, we can think that outward rebellion is so easy to see, right? But we have to be so careful because inward rebellion can look so good, so good, but be so detrimental and keep you from coming to the Lord. You know, often people say, you know, the, the, the rebellious children, those often come to the Lord. It's the well-behaved ones that we should worry about. It's kind of like the parable of the, of the, of the, the, of the prodigal son right? Here's a son who in all things complies to his father. And he's been there all along. And he does not rebel. And he does not leave his father. Or does he? Does he love the father? Well, we see in that parable that it is the son who rebels. And the son who outwardly rejects the father. He is the one who comes. And he is the one who loves And is loved by the Father. So, parents, are you raising your children to be like the older son? Are you more concerned with their outward behavior? And that you're not embarrassed by the way they behave? Or are you seeking to shepherd their hearts so that they may know the Lord? And pray to the Lord, use whatever you may. But bring my children to you. It's better to confess than to conceal. In verse 3, we see that the corruption of Israel is so deep that even the kings and princes celebrate the evil of the people. Such low regard for the holiness of God. Now, Israel doesn't only rebel against God in this way. Israel also rebels against God by selfishly embracing passions of the flesh. Look at verse 4. They are adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker sees to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it's leavened. On the day of our king, the princess becomes sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand... He stretched out his hand with mockers. For with hearts like an oven, they approach their intrigue. All night, their anger smolders. In the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are like hot, are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. We're going to start seeing a really interesting feature now from verse 4 to the end of this, of this chapter. We're going to start seeing a really interesting feature of prophetic literature. And these are illustrations. The prophet is using illustrations to depict the, 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 the rebellion of Israel. Illustrations are kind of like the windows in a building. Right? A building without window is dark. But... but but a building that has windows, light comes in. So, so God is using illustrations here to help us see and understand the rebellion of Israel. In verse 4, God, God calls them adulterers. But although there is sexual sin in the life of Israel, God is using the sin of adultery here to refer to idolatry, right? Adultery is when... Is when You look for those things that you should only look for in your spouse in someone else. Idolatry is when you look for those things you should only look for in God in something else. We see this in the first illustration. He says, they are like a heated oven. I don't know if any of you has ever seen a, a wooden oven before, but, but once the wood is placed in the oven and lit, uh, the, heat, the heat continues as the cook stirs the wood. But this oven here is so hot, no stirring is 
need it. You can feel this in. The heated oven is depicting hearts intensely burning for pleasure and power. The pleasure, the burning is intoxicating. Passions can be so powerful that even powerful men will feel intoxicate, intoxicated by them and will lose their controls. Look at verse 5. Princes become intoxicated with wine and join mockers. Again, in verse 6, we see that the, the oven illustration. That oven burns morning and night and is never satisfied. In verse 7, everyone is indicted. All of them, all of Israel, no exception, is like a burning oven. And they burn hot. This reminds me of, of the story in the book of Genesis of, of Abraham interceding for Sodom. Abraham comes before God and says, Lord, would you spare Sodom? If you found 50 people that are faithful, but not 50 people were found, would you spare Sodom if you found 40, 30, 20, 10? No faithfulness was found in Sodom except for Lot and his family. Abraham is interceding, but God is saying there's no hope for this city. Now Israel is like Sodom, consumed by their passions, obsessed with their own desires. And even the kings that were made glad by the evil in verse 3, now in verse 7, they are devoured. During the time of Hosea, several kings were killed by those who would take their place. When ungodly passions run a society, the society falls apart. When ungodly passions runs a heart, the person falls apart. But here you may say, well, wait, I thought it's good to be passionate, right? I mean, who wants to hear singers who are not passionate and watch movies without passion? Uh, who wants to deal with bland people? Passion is good, right? And I would say, yes, of course passion is good, absolutely. Throughout the Bible, we see great examples of passion, right? Here's David and his Psalms, or the prophets and their call for justice. Jesus correcting false teachers. Paul defending sound doctrine. Even, we even see sexual passion as a good thing in the Bible. The first poem ever written was a poem of love from a husband to a wife in Genesis 2. There is a whole book in the Bible dedicated to the celebration of sexual intimacy between a husband and a wife. God made us passionate because God is a passionate God. So we ought to be passionate and embrace passions. But the great issue here is what are we passionate about? Are you passionate about God? I mean, when, when, you're, when you're mind, when you have time to think, does God consume your thoughts? Is God the one that you think of when your head hits the pillow? Are we passionate for God? Or are we passionate for things? God made things. So God must be the object of our passion. This is the very definition of idolatry. Here's, here's how I define idolatry. Loving things more than God. Being passionate about things rather than being passionate about God. But we have been given a different commandment. We were told 
In Matthew 22, 37, you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. There's no place for a divided heart when it comes to being devoted to God. God demands full allegiance. He demands your calendar. He demands your relationships and your wallet. He demands you honor him with your words, with your weekends, and with your web browsing. Coming to God is like bungee jumping, okay? You can't be half committed to that, right? You can't kind of bungee jump, right? You either jump or you back off. Those are the two options for bungee jumping. That's how God is. You either commit or you reject. There's no middle ground. A few months ago, Tommy Morgado and I were in the office. And, and I think Glory called us and said, Hey, there's a young man here that wants to know what the gospel is. Okay? That's what we pray for, isn't it? We pray for opportunities to share the gospel. I mean, doesn't sound more, doesn't sound like you can get a lower hanging fruit than someone coming to a church office and saying, hey, what's the gospel? And so we're excited. I mean, that's, that's what we live for. We, we live for that. We want to see people hear the gospel, repent, and believe. So we shared the gospel with him, and he was excited. He was like, man, this is a great message. We're like, have you ever heard this message before? No, never heard this. I mean, grew up in America, never heard it before. Strange, but he had never heard it. And we kept telling him of the joys of Christian life. We told him we got together every Sunday morning, every Wednesday evening. And you should commit and you should live life with us. And you should come and you should be with us and you should live life together. Christian fellowship is so sweet. It's so great. The young boy stopped us. He, you see, he was, he was very determined in life. He was 18. He, had already, he was already working on his master's degree. And he looked at us and he said, how much time commitment will that require of me? And we told him, this will require your whole life. The young man walked out of that office and never walked in again. Because he loved the world more than he loved God. He was committed to the pleasures of the world more than he was committed to God. How much commitment will God require of you? God will require all of you. You deal with your family for the glory of God. You raise your children for the glory of God. You work for the glory of God. You come to church for the glory of God. You confront one another for the glory of God. You encourage one another for the glory of God. You sing for the glory of God. You eat for the glory of God. You drink for the glory of God. There is nothing that a Christian does that is not for the glory of God. We arrange our lives around the glory of God. How can we maximize the glory of God? There is no room for the world in the heart of a Christian. God will require your whole life. Oh, my heart breaks for this young man. We continued texting him afterwards. And at a point, he stopped answering. He was so close to the kingdom, yet so far. Friends, let us not be so close to the kingdom, yet so far. Let us not stop at the gates of heaven. Let's enter the gates of heaven. Let us dedicate our Sunday morning to the Lord, but let us dedicate our Monday morning as well. May our Monday morning not be for the world. Let us serve in nursery with a smile, but also serve our husbands and wives and children with a smile. Let us have Christian friends at church, but let us have Christian friends at school as well. Let us, let, we must let the world know we are Christians. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. There's no room for friendship with the world 
in the life of the Christian. If you're here today and you're saying, there's no passion in my heart for God. I'm here because I'm trying to please someone else. I want you to know that at a point, that was all of us. We all at a point had no love for God in our hearts. We hated and rejected God. But we have been deeply changed. And how have we been changed? We have been changed by a message. And I want you to know this message. Because as Christians, that's what we carry. We, we are jars of clay who carry a precious message. Friend, if your heart is cold towards God, listen to this. Okay? Listen to this. God, God created all things. He made the universe. He made the bumblebees. There's nothing in the universe that was not made by God. He made you. And he loved you. And he told you, all I ask of you is for you to love me with all your heart, soul, and strength. And you and I said, no. And we rebelled and we lived for ourselves rather than for God. But the love of God didn't stop that. He didn't stop there because God sought us out. God seeks out rebels. God sent his son. And, and, and even though we broke the law of God, his son kept it perfectly. He lived a perfect life and died a death not because he deserved, because he did, he did no wrong. He died a death on the cross saying, I'm dying so that you can be made right with God. If you believe in me, if you believe in me, my righteous life will be accounted to you. Friends, if your heart is cold towards God, listen to this message. You can't turn a switch on and off, but you can hear the message. And if, you, and if the Holy Spirit testifies to this message in your heart, he may be doing it right now, you will be saved and you will be transformed. And you're going to see your life change. And instead of coming to church to please your spouse, to please your parents, to try to acquire some sort of status, you're going to start coming to church because you love God. And since you love God, you love His Word. And you want to hear it preached. And since you love God, you love His people. You want to be around His people. And you want to serve His people. You want to be well equipped so that you can go and preach the gospel to other people. So that they can be changed. That is true transformation. That is heart transformation. So hear this message today. And come to the Lord. Do not be like Israel. Come. Turn to the Lord. We can be deeply changed. I want you to know this message today. Because this message has changed my heart. And it can change yours as well. Let's look at the third point today. So Israel also rebelled against God by seeking the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Verse 8, Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength and he knows it not. Gray hairs are like sprinkle, are sprinkled upon him and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. In verse 8, again, God indicts Ephraim or Israel for mixing themselves with other peoples. God is not being against diversity here. God loves diversity, right? So when, when, when Peter says, now I know that God makes no 
no distinction among men. That's what he means, right? God saves all people. But at this time in salvation history, God is telling Israel, Israel, I have a purpose for you. My purpose is to bless the nations. But when you go with the nations, you worship their God. So don't do that. Don't mix with the other peoples. And we have another, a second illustration here, right? Israel is a cake not turned. A cake not turned is raw on one side and burned on the other side. In other words, it's, it's useless. Nobody wants to eat that. A few months ago, Alex Hoppert and I were, were making a pizza, pizza from scratch on a Koinonia Wednesday. And uh, our amateur pizza making skills could not keep up with the professional oven that we were doing, we're using, right? So we burned about five pizza pies, right, in a row. And the people were hungry. And we didn't know what to do, right, because we had people and we had promised great pizza. But we burned them. You know what we did? We, what we did with the pizzas we burned? We threw them in the trash. They were worthless. Burned pizza, right? There, I mean, a good pizza is an evidence of God, right? God is good, <laughs> right? But a burned pizza is an, is an evidence of rebellion, right? <laughs> Gosh, throw it in the trash. That's what God is saying here. Israel, Israel, because you have mixed yourselves... With other people, you're like a burned pizza. The sin and corruption of Israel is so deep that Israel is as good as burned cake. Now look at verse 9. In verse 9, strangers devour his strength. And Israel does not notice it. Israel has gray hairs. Israel is losing his strength. But he does not know it. And where is this weakness of Israel coming from? It's coming from the fact that Israel is not listening to God. When God says, do not mix with other people. But Israel does. And because of that, Israel is weak. And it's a dangerous thing to be weak and not know it. This reminds me of a story in the book of uh, Judges. Judges, I think 12 or 16. There's a man called Samson. Kids, do you know this story? It's a good story, right? Samson was kind of like a, like a superhero, right? He could fight a thousand people at once. He used weird weapons like bones. But he still won, right? He carried heavy things. He, 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 he fought lions and he won. He, he was kind of like, he was kind of like a superhero, right? It's, it's, it's a biblical superhero. But Samson trusted himself too much. He did things God told him he shouldn't do. Once he was tied up because he wanted to show off his strength. And his wife, who was against him, told him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. And the Bible says, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. He didn't know he was weak. He had trusted in his strength too much. So therefore he became a slave. Christians are called not to trust in their own strength, but to boast in their weakness. Trusting that you're too strong comes from pride. The world wants to tell you, boast on your strength. The Bible tells you, boast on your weaknesses. But when we know that we are weak, then we have to look for somebody who is strong to help us. Hey, kids. There's several of you among us today. Do you sometimes feel afraid? Do you sometimes perhaps fear the dark? What about being alone? Do you, do you fear being alone? Do you sometimes fear people who are stronger, bigger than you? That's a good thing. Did you know that? Because... This is an opportunity for you to be humble. 
Can I teach you a simple verse? Okay, if you're kids today, in age or heart, let me teach you this verse. Psalm 56, 3, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Isn't that easy to memorize? When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Right? Humble people put their trust in God. And God loves humble people. Samson trusted too much in his strength and his enemies captured him. Samson was proud and so was Israel, right? Look at verse 10. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. So because of that, Israel doesn't go to God. Feel this in. Pride is self-reliance. But humility is God-reliance. So what should Israel have done if Israel was humble? Israel should have gone to God and not to the peoples. So kids, I'm still talking to you, okay? When you're afraid or weak or anxious, you should go to God. You should pray to God. If you feel that way today, if you feel weak, anxious, okay, if there's something that's concerning you, concerning you about school tomorrow, can I encourage you to talk to your parents? Today during lunch, just say, hey, mom, hey, dad, how do I seek God? How do I trust God? And, and I pray that your mom or your dad will be able to help you with that. Now, in verse 11, we find another illustration. Ephraim is like a dove, silly, and without sense, right? This is not the dove that Jesus tells us to be like. Jesus tells us to be humble like a dove. No, no. This is a silly dove, right? This is, uh, doves are, are simple birds. There's nothing remarkable about them. They're not pretty. They're not strong. They don't fly very high or very far. And in Israel is being compared to a dove who is already simple and a dove that is silly. Why? Because Israel wanted to fly to Egypt and Assyria for help. These are the superpowers, right? They can certainly help us. Let's fly to Egypt. Let's fly to Assyria. These are the ones that can provide stability and money and resources. Or can they? No. These are the enemies. Israel was enslaved by Egypt. Israel was enslaved by Assyria. Israel wanted money, power, influence. But Israel wanted all that without God. It's going to be a good reminder for us. We can think that God is the one that provides all things for us spiritually. But, oh, money, power, influence? No, no, no. We go to the world for that, right? The Bible tells us that God is the one who will supply every need we have. So when we have need, what do we do? We go to God. Jesus ta taught us to pray, Lord, give us today our daily bread. Because God supplies for every need we have. God takes care of the birds. Will he not take care of us as well? Now in verse 12 and 13, we see the emotional apex of this passage. God promises to judge Israel. God will bring Israel down. The silly dove. He's going to cast his net and will discipline Israel. No longer will Israel be able to fly around from nation to nation. The discipline will be according to the report made to their congregation. In other words, Israel was willingly breaking the covenant with the Lord. And the punishment much must match the crime. Israel had heard the word of God. Therefore, Israel had great responsibility before the Lord. You have heard the word of God. 
Therefore, you have great responsibility before God. John 12, 48 says, The one who rejects me and does not receive what? My words. Has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Friends, do you understand that the mere fact that you're sitting under the preaching of the word, if you reject it, will amount to judgment on you in the last day. You have been re- to you have been revealed the oracles of truth of God. Do not reject the gospel. Do not reject the word of come to the Lord and live. The word of Jesus proclaimed demands a response. You can fill this in. No one stands indifferently before Jesus. He's either your savior or he is your judge. Who is Jesus to you today? In verse 13, we hear a strong warning of imminent condemnation. Again, because of Israel's rebellion. And then we see a word we haven't seen since the first verse. God would heal them. God would redeem Israel. But Israel rejects God. Israel had a, had a conditional covenant with God. See, in the Old Testament, the covenant was conditioned on obedience. Deuteronomy 28. Israel, if you obey the words of this law, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. Perfect obedience to the law was required. But they disobey. But we too have a covenant with God. And it is a conditional covenant as well. The New, the New Testament covenant condition is faith. Faith in the one who obeyed. So we come to God not showing our great works, but saying we're trusting in the great works of him who said it is finished, meaning the whole law has been Fulfilled. Are you resting in the finished work of Christ today? Finally, we're going to look at the fourth point, and this is a brief point. Standing in enmity against God. They do not cry to me from their hearts, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and white, they gash themselves. They, gash themselves. they rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Once again, we see Israel who is emotionally invested in the wrong things. They do not cry to the Lord from their hearts. Instead, they cry in their bed. Right? They cut themselves. Perhaps likely as a ceremony to a foreign god like Baal. They cut themselves for what? For grain and for wine. They're spilling their own blood to gain something God told them they could have for free. If they just came to him, look at Isaiah 55. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money... The grace of God is free. Come, buy and eat. Buy? With whose money? With the money that God supplies through His Son. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Everything belongs to God. And God is willing to give to us all that we need. But Israel is gashing themselves to receive. To receive what? Counterfeit gain, grain. Counterfeit wine. They rebel against God. They rebel against the very thing they need. You know, you didn't think I was going to get through this whole sermon and not tell you a story about my son, right? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Don't you know me by now? 
So my son does that too, you know that? So when it's nap time, you know what I do when it's nap time for me? I nap, okay? You know what my son does? He kicks and screams and cries. But Boaz, all you need to do is fall asleep. Why are you fighting your nap? Nobody complains when you sleep. Everybody's happy. He fights the very thing he needs. He doesn't know. Oh, I just wish you knew how good it is to nap. <laughs> you would embrace it wholeheartedly. Friends, we're like that too. God tells us what we need and we fight against it. In verse 15, we see that God trained their arms, but they still turn against God. Could this be more foolish? Man fighting God? Who will win? God, of course. It's neither safe nor wise to stand as an enemy of God. In verse 16, he goes on to give us our last illustration in this passage. Israel is a treacherous bull. Israel is a faulty weapon. Israel is fighting against God. And Israel doesn't even function properly. A treacherous ball will slap you in the arm, will hurt you. The very device that you're trying to use against God will turn against you. They misfire. And for that reason, the princes will fall by the sword. You see, the text doesn't say here in verse 16 that the kings will fall by the sword. Because if the kings fall, that's okay. They're princes, right? There's hope. But when the princes fall... What's the hope? So it's a bleak picture. A picture of no hope. Israel, not the son of God, but the enemy of God. But remember in the beginning that we said that, that Israel's sin was like Adam's sin, right? Well, is there hope for the rebel? Is there hope for Israel? Well, there's a second Adam. The second Adam did not sin, unlike Israel. He was actually righteous in every way. He was called, just like Israel, the Son of God. He was the faithful remnant. Unlike Adam, he did not break the covenant, but he kept it. And because he kept every single letter of the law, all of the blessings that belong to faithful Israel was given to Christ. And friends, those blessings, every blessing from the Old Testament and New Testament can be yours if you're simply found in Christ. If you are Christ's and Christ is yours. This is the hope for the rebel to be united with Christ. But he was not only blessed, he was also cursed. He died a criminal's death, but not because of his own sin. He died for the rebel, for you and me, the rebel. Listen to Romans 5:10. For if while we were enemies, not indifferent, enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the, by the death of His Son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we, shall we be saved by His life. Friends, this is the hope of the rebel. This is clear. We are all rebels. None of us can escape this charge. But, you can fill this in. The hope for the rebel... The only way rebels can find hope is by giving our rebellion to the only one who never rebelled. And that is Jesus Christ. So the invitation to Israel was come to God. The invitation to you today is come to Christ. Come to Him and find life. Even, even though 
You and I are rebels. Let's pray.